Good evening, everybody. Beautiful day out there. And it's a good good weather to talk about nature and about the garden. And uh, let's begin with a prayer before we get into the subject. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to assemble together, Father, this time that you have sanctified, Father, this time that you have appointed uh, for blessings for, for us all in, in fellowship, in receiving of a greater outpouring of your spirit, as our brother Gary shared, by what is revealed to us in the book of Numbers, Father, that uh, the sacrifices are symbols, they're symbols of something, and it's, it is, it's a symbol of that greater outpouring of your spirit, which does come at a greater cost, Father, when so much of the world rejects you, and, and when we find ourselves falling into sin, Father, that rejection uh, hits home. And so we pray that you may sanctify us and cleanse us from this, Father, and that you would bless us, open up our ears, Father, as we, uh, as we near the, the end, Father, it is, I think, the, the history of how the earth began uh, becomes that much important, uh, or that much more important. And so I pray that you would help us and help me to speak, Father, your words we pray in Jesus' name. Genesis 2.17 But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. I know John shared that statement in, I believe, his first presentation. What? How do we read that statement? Is that, is that a declaration of events that will transpire, uh, or is that potentially, is that a threat? A declaration of a warning, or a threat? Well, what did Satan, let's, let me ask this question, what did Satan tell Eve? What did she say to, or what did he say to her? Thou shalt not surely die. What does that insinuate in the mind of Eve? Absolutely, and, and then it becomes a threat because what does he tell her? Instead of dying, you shall be as gods. So therefore, her perception, her understanding of God's character in that moment changes, and now she believes that he is hiding or withholding something from her. And so, in order to... With excuse me, to withhold that from her, that he withhold that by force. And so their whole, whole it goes from, as, as John has pointed out, from faith to one of a belief, a belief about what God has said to her, which then changes to a belief about her creator. And so what was the consequence, guys, uh, what was the consequence of, of their sin? It was death, absolutely. And the question, as as I just asked, as uh, that we need to ask is, we need to go a bit deeper than that. If if we believe it's not a threat, and that the threat, the idea that it is a threat, because of their response that they ran and hid for fear, if that if that idea was planted into their minds because of the lie that Satan told them, then what is what is the true understanding of what? how that death comes to be, and what that death really is. Um, their, their trust, as, as I pointed out, their trust and dependence left God, and they formed their own belief. And, and that belief was predicated on, on the insinuations of Satan, to where now they look at God as someone perhaps who has arbitrary rules or restrictions, withholding. Perhaps then we see that instead of a statement, or a warning, we say that as, as we said, a threat. And so that becomes our whole perception. And that, just like that, changes. And that, that is something that Satan, in these last days, uh, is working relentlessly to do to us as well. To put his attributes, his own attributes, on God and to clothe him in those. 
this. So instead, as we talked about, this is a warning. This is God was trying to protect them. Protect them from knowledge which, uh, the knowledge of immense guilt, the guilt that Satan felt. And I don't have the quote from Spirit of Prophecy with me, but she says that to that essence, that the knowledge of the tree of good and evil is that knowledge of guilt. And so that's what God was trying to protect them from and to warn them. So if, if he says, if you eat thereof, you shall surely die, let's, let's talk about that and, and let's think on that. Uh, what does that death entail? What does that death mean? If, I'll oh, go ahead. Absolutely, because if we know that John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And what does Acts 17, 28 tell us? For in him we live, we move, we have our being. And then Hebrews 1, 3 tells us that all things are upheld by the word of his power. So to separate ourselves from that, from Christ, Absolutely, we're removing ourselves from the source of life. The guilt, guilt makes us want to get out of that. We, we remove ourselves from the source of life. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and what happens? So, then, so if we remove ourselves from that source of life, what are Adam and Eve effectively doing to their Savior? Let's look at Hebrews. Absolutely, and let's look at Hebrews 6.6. 6. Let's turn there. Hebrews 6, 6. And it reads, If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So was it fair to say that by turning away from the source of life because of the lies that we believe from Satan, that we're crucifying our Savior? That would seem to be supported also by the Spirit of Prophecy statement that says, and this is beautiful, as soon as there was sin, there was a Savior. That's what's going on. And so there's nothing in that warning, uh, as we've just mentioned, there was nothing arbitrary about that. That was a message of love and of mercy, of protection. But again, because we trusted in our own understanding to form a belief, that's, that whole misunderstanding came to be, and we looked at our source of life as now a destroyer. And so we cut ourselves off from that life. And, and just to, to further add a weight of evidence to, to understanding more of God's character, uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 13. And actually, let me, before, well, as we're flipping to that, so let's go to Matthew 9, 13. If we cut ourselves off from the source of life, Proverbs 8, 36 spells it out pretty clearly. All they that hate me love death. And so that's the consequence of our own decisions. No arbitrary decree from our Father. So Matthew 9, 13. And I'm just going to read from the middle of the verse here. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. And to add to that, let's look at Psalms 40, verse 6. And this tells us, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. So not only did God issue some sort of, not only did he not issue a threat and an arbitrary decree, but he's also, we're also seeing here that mercy 
is what God is, who he is. It says he, the scriptures say he's ever merciful. And so if, if we're seeing that he's not demanding, he's not desiring sacrifice, then that can also shed light on understanding why the animal sacrifices were brought about in the first place. If that's not God's desire, but yet by believing the lies of Satan, we become, we don't have that enmity that will come, and we'll get to that. And so our mind is in, it's incapable of being able to comprehend the deceit that has entered into us from the father of lies, Satan. And so, how, do, how does God, how do you tell somebody that they're about to jump off a cliff if they don't, if they don't realize that's what they're doing? The only way you can't, you can't tell, and maybe that's a bad analogy, but in order to save someone from something by which they don't know the danger thereof, we can talk and talk and talk till we're blue in the face, but if if, that, if we don't know, then we need to look at it a different way. Perhaps we need to, this needs to be demonstrated to them. And so the sacrificial system, as we're seeing by the scriptures here, this is a way to reach man. This is a way to show us what we're doing every time we turn away from the source of life, from when we turn away from Christ, which we did there in the garden. We crucified him. So again, the animal sacrifice is symbolizing, right? They're symbolizing that great sacrifice. They're reminding us, this is, this is our natural heart. Now that we have chosen to believe the enemy, and the lies have come into us, this, this is what we do. And so this is a reminder to us. This is something that keeps us dependent upon. And, and the law enters, what does it say in, uh, uh, is that Romans 5.20? I think where the law enters so that sin abounds. Am I in the right place? And where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. Absolutely. And so let's ask this too. What were the consequences of Adam and Eve's decision on the creation? Was there death before they did that? No, absolutely not. Were there seasons? Let me say seasons in a, and that's a good point. Seasons in a sense of that we would understand, were, were, there, were there time periods where there was a shortage of food for the creatures that God created? No. Absolutely not. We know, do we, were, did the leaves fall off the trees? No. Absolutely not. And so we have all of a sudden, there, that self-deception of their heart that is separating themselves from the source of life, crucifying their Savior afresh, it's being reflected in the creation. So we're seeing death for the first time. We're seeing leaves falling off the trees. We're seeing animals killing other animals. And then Adam is asked, again, in order for him to understand what he has done to his Savior, Adam is asked to actually, yes, that's right. Spirit of Prophecy confirms that. Adam was asked to make the first animal sacrifice. Some people will say, well, did, where did the, the skins, the animal skins come from? Well, the Spirit probably was confirming it was Adam that was asked. Because, again, he had to, in order to be shown what he was doing. Because he was, he was unconscious. He was unaware of that. And so let me ask these questions. So everything changes. Death now enters. Animals are killing other animals. Plants eventually, right, they become, some plants become poisonous and noxious. Um, what's that? Thorns and thistles. Yes, absolutely. We'll get to that. So, uh, and this is all because of a lack of faith in their Heavenly Father, right? And it's being reflected in creation. So, the question is, is if God is ever merciful, and if God really is love, and we know the answer to this, He didn't leave them hopeless, did He? Because if Christ would have completely withdrawn, then their, everything would have fallen apart. And we know that all of creation is upholded by the Son of God. So, so his character was forced out. They pushed him away. They turned away from his character, but it's still his power that is giving them breath of life, that is allowing all the creation to continue on. And this is a, a cool little quote here from Education 101. I have the notes. If anybody's interested in this, I'll be happy to 
to get them to you later. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. And that's quoting Jeremiah 29, 11. This is a message that in the light from the cross may be read upon all the face of nature. The heavens declares glory and the earth is full of his riches. So even despite what we have done, God is still expressing his love through his son, through creation. There's still mercy seen. Still goodness. And now let's go to our, basically this is, this is the, um, the confirmation or the, the plan of action uh, of the Council of Peace that was obviously between the Father and Son before man sinned as a potential plan. If they should fall into sin, here's what we will do. And we see that in the, the first, the, first in, the instance of putting this into action, the first instance, and that's Genesis 3.15. And we all know that. I'll just read it. And this is giving us something that we didn't have before. And that is before, after, once we sinned. And this is, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So here is the new covenant promise to Adam and Eve. Here's hope. And here is, for the first time, enmity is hatred, right? So uh, I've heard, you know, the, the question could be asked, well, why couldn't it be said, why couldn't God have just said, I will put love for me in your heart? The challenge is they didn't know the depth of corruption and the self-deceit that they just inherited from Satan. And so this, this is to give them that understanding that the Spirit of Christ is letting them know just what happens and in, in, in how, how their choices uh, have cut themselves away from the source of life. And we know that God's ways also are not those of force. And as we've said, uh, he's not attaching arbitrary limitations. And I want to show that through another scripture. Let's go to Proverbs 26.2. Proverbs 26.2. And it says, As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless, causeless shall not come. In other words, it's, it's not arbitrary. This is, this is something that God has allowed us through the gift, one of the greatest gifts, probably second only to the gift of his son, uh, is the gift of freedom of choice, freedom of conscience, and, and to give us the freedom to experience the consequences of our ways. Because to not do that would not be truly exercising selfless love. Because to take away the option for your child to potentially make a bad choice that could hurt them is not allowing them the freedom to choose you, to choose to really give you their love or not. It's, it's starting to exercise force. Is that, does that make sense? Okay. And here said another way. Let's go to Jeremiah 2.19. Jeremiah 2.19. Jeremiah 19. That tells us, Thine own wickedness shall correct thee. So it's out of God's mercy that he allows us to experience these consequences and that through that we can be corrected. Again, we can, because of this enmity and, and thanks to the law entering, we can realize sin. We realize the sinfulness of sin and that will lead us right back to our Savior. And thy backsliding shall reprove thee. And I want to go to Psalms 9.16. This is uh, just giving us a, some more scriptural understanding of God's judgment. Psalms 9.16. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. 
So that's saying if we study the scriptures closely, we will understand who he is. We will understand his character based upon the judgment which he executes. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. And one more. Let's go to Ezekiel 36, 19. Ezekiel 36, 19. And I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings, I judged them. As you judge, you will be judged. And so I'm making these points to, to build a foundation for our relationship to the creation, to how, how God has designed that, and, and what in the changes in the creation... Uh, why are those changes coming to be? And I've kind of alluded to that already. And, and what's the reason behind this? And so to continue on here, I just want to, I just want to illustrate too that, the, that even, even the unfallen worlds, even the beings on the unfallen worlds and even the angels, right at the time where Christ was about to come to the earth for the first time, that uh, these statements right here are rather eye-opening as to to their understanding uh, of God's character. And I'll read from Signs of the Times, August 27, 1902, paragraph 4. And then I'm just reading a bolded part of this paragraph. With intense interest, God's movements were watched by the heavenly angels. Would he come forth from his place to punish the inhabitants of the world for their iniquity? Would he send fire or flood to destroy them? All heaven waited the bidding of their commander to pour out the vials of wrath upon a rebellious world. One word from him, one sign in the world would have been destroyed. The world's unfallen would have said, Amen, thou art righteous, O God, because thou hast exterminated rebellion. One more here. This is from Bible Echo, March 8, 1897. The heavenly angels looked upon the world polluted by sin under the inhabitants thereof and thought how much easier it would be to exterminate it than to reform it. But the Son of God Himself came to work a reformation. His mercy had never been demonstrated up until that time in the universe to that extent. We know there's a statement, and I won't go into this as a whole message for another day, but there's a statement about Satan and his rebellion in heaven, and it says that he never tested the forgiving love of God. So it wasn't demonstrated for the angels. It wasn't demonstrated for the unfallen worlds. Sin, as we know, sin had never entered the universe before. Everybody was living according to the law of liberty and the law of love. And so, this is a beautiful illustration of how God, who, who he really is, but then how, how he deals with his children and all of his created beings, knowing that we fully don't understand. understand. He demonstrates it. He allows us the freedom to, to have these thoughts, but he demonstrates it to us of what his character really is. And the greatest demonstration is in the gift of his son. And here, back to how things, how we can, as man, we can receive instruction from God, and we have a choice. We can read it in different ways. And I want to illustrate that as well by looking at Deuteronomy 11, verse 26. Deuteronomy 11, verse 26. And this is the instruction that Moses has set before the people. Blessings and cursings. And it says here, after giving this list, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods. So he's giving us the freedom, the freedom to make those choices and experience the consequences of our choices. And so I'm now I'm illustrating that to, to help us to look at the, the father and son relationship. So there is, it's far more, and I think, I think most of us realize this, um, and maybe some to varying degrees that have studied, but there's far more to that relationship than just you know, a head knowledge of, you know, 
wow, my Savior is the literal Son of God, you know, and that His Father is a literal Father. There's a practical application, and, and hopefully it should, if we prayerfully ask God and invite Him to, it should, it should affect every aspect of our lives. And that's, John has pointed that out uh, by talking about the faith of Jesus is what we need. That is what should permeate every decision that we make. And, and I just want to show a little bit more of this pattern and, and just look at a, one specific example and then, and then show this pattern in our relationship with the creation. And so let's go to 1 Corinthians 8, 6. And we're going to look at this pattern of father and son here. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Some of you probably are very, very familiar with this. And it says, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. So we have the Father, of whom are all things, and his Son, by whom are all things. And then let's go to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. And we're going to illustrate this pattern. Hebrews 1, verse 3. There's one, one illustration of it. And this is referring to Christ here. Who being the brightness of his glory, his being the Father's glory, and express, express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. So he's the brightness of the Father's glory. He came out from his Father. He was begotten of his Father. Where did Eve come from? Out of Adam. Right? She was taken from his side, taken from one of the ribs. And so if we look at the husband and wife relationship that God has given us with the marriage, the institution of marriage, it's designed... What it's designed to teach us of our father and his son, right? And so we have the husband, right, is the, the glory, and then there is a magnification of that glory in the wife, the brightness of his glory. See, it's patterning. Again, we're looking at this pattern, a visible pattern of what is in heaven. It's just not visible to us. And let's see, is there any other point I want to make on that? Oh, and then we know that we were made, of course, we were made in their image. Let, let us make man in our image, made in the image of Father and Son. And Ellen White has a, a short quote here from Education 15. This is important. Uh, it was his purpose that the longer man lived, the more fully he should reveal the image, the more fully reflect glory of his creator. All of his faculties were capable of development. Their capacity and their vigor were continually to increase. So there's this, con and we know, right? We know that there, we will be learning throughout all, all eternity. And so we were designed to more, our character was going to continue to develop. And that's without sin entering the universe. But we know after it entered the universe, it's still the same call. And so looking at Genesis 3, 17 to 19, with that in mind of that we are to continuously develop our character, which is our understanding of who God is, and by faith have that, believe that, believe the words of Jesus, because he believed the word of his Father, because he is the author and finisher of faith. And so let's look at uh, the curse. Is the curse, and we, looked, we just looked at there in Deuteronomy, that there, behold, I want to put for you, before you blessings and cursings. And you choose, you decide. And so the ground being cursed, as it says in Genesis 3, 17, 19, is cursed for our sake. So does that mean there's a blessing in it? I would think so. I would think so. And it continues on. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. The ground shall bring forth, as we had said earlier, I think Gary or Carolyn said, thorns and thistles, and you will return to the very ground of which the food you eat is from. So what is, what is this telling us? Why is this happening? We are going to express why this is happening, right? Because of ourselves separating from the source of life. And so then this is being reflected in the creation. If, if there is a pattern of father and son relationship that is written, and we know that, that the Godhead can be understood through all that was made and it was visible, right? It says that in Romans chapter 1. So can we see 
then that there's a relationship that is potentially here it's being reflected in our relationship to the creation because if we if we our, our moral faculties our very character was to develop continuously then if our character the opposite could be true if, if it was to develop continuously then it would be expressed visibly in the creation so that you would have a greater abundance you would have greater beauty you would have greater health greater nutrition, all these things and and i go on later with some quotes where ellen white says that eden was intended to spread across all the earth so there was development as our character is developing because we're understanding more of the faith of jesus it will be reflected in nature and so the opposite is true if our character is degenerating the opposite of what they tell us today that we're evolving then is that possibly being reflected in nature as well have things gotten worse on this earth or better They've gotten a lot worse, right? Absolutely. And so I want to read uh, and, and to provide some more scriptural, a uh, scriptural foundation for this, for this, that that the earth is reflecting us. Uh, I want to look at some quotes from Spirit of Prophecy and some scriptures. And so when it talks about the ground being cursed and the thorns and thistles being brought forth, and then and then it gets cursed a second time when Cain slew his brother Abel, and then it was going to be harder for the ground to yield, right? And then after the flood happens, it's a threefold curse. But during this whole time, God's still, out of his mercy and his love, he hasn't abandoned us to utter destruction. This world hasn't completely fallen apart. Because if it were to fall apart, that means Christ's completely withdrawn all of his power. And so let's look at this quote from letter 59, 1898. The Lord's curse is upon the earth, upon man, upon beast, upon the fish in the sea, and as transgression becomes almost universal, the curse will be permitted to become as broad and as deep as transgression. So it's reflecting us, for better or for worse. Another quote out of Education 26, page 26. Continually they were reminded also of their lost dominion. Among the lower creatures, Adam had stood as king. And so long as he remained loyal to God, all nature acknowledged his rule. But when he transgressed, this dominion was forfeited. The spirit of rebellion to which he himself had given entrance through choosing to believe the lies of Satan extended throughout the animal creation. So that same spirit of rebellion that he exercised to his creator was extended into the animal kingdom. The animals rebelled against man. They were fearful of man where they weren't before. Thus, not only the life of man, but the nature of the beasts, the trees of the forest, the grass of the field, the very air he breathed, all told the sad lesson of the knowledge of evil. So there's a key word there, lesson. It's for our understanding, our admonition. When we see these things out in creation, they're for us to understand what it is that we have done and continue to do when we sin against our Savior. And this statement is, is quite profound. Uh, it's, it, it suggests a sensitivity that has, uh, we have given up long ago. And it says this, this is from One Spirit of Prophecy 58. As Adam witnessed the first signs of, the de of decaying nature in the falling leaf and in the drooping flowers, he mourned more deeply than men now mourn over their dead. That suggests that he had a connection and intimacy with that creation of, uh, to a far greater degree than, than what we have today and maybe what we can even fully understand. It says, the drooping flowers were not so deep a cause of grief, because more, they're more tender and delicate. But the tall, noble, sturdy trees, to cast off their leaves, to decay, presented before him the general dissolution of beautiful nature, which God had created for the especial benefit of man. And let's look at some scriptural examples now to illustrate again. Our, the, the effects of the corruption of our minds and, and our turning away from the source of life and our idolatry, how this affects creation. Let's go to Job uh, 31. We're going to look at verses 38 to 40. Job 31, 
Hang in there, guys. I heard a yawn. We're going to get through. It was, all, it was all that delicious dessert. Dessert Wednesday is done us in. And the last presentation was very thought-provoking, too, so we've expended a lot of mental energy. Job 31. Good thing we've come to an appointed time, though, and our Father can give us infinite supply. Okay, beginning at verse 38. If my land cry against me, or that the furrows likewise thereof complain, if I have eaten the fruits thereof without money, or caused the owners, and if we look at other translations, or if we look at the, uh, the, cordon, the concordance, it's talking about the laborers. Because Job, is, you know, he was one of the wealthiest men, maybe the wealthiest man at the time. He wasn't the one who was picking and harvesting his own food. And so, or have caused the laborers thereof to lose their life. Let thistles grow instead of wheat, and cockle instead of barley. So Job appears to have an understanding. I mean, you have choices. You can say, oh, he's just speaking poetically, or he was ignorant. Or perhaps he had this understanding that, that his, to turn away from selflessness, to turn away from love, right? Because God is love, implies that we're going into selfishness. And that selfishness would be expressed in not taking care of your laborers. And to do that, it seems to be suggesting here that thistles will grow instead of wheat. And that you will have cockle instead of barley. Now let's look at Job 20, verse 27. Job 20, verse 27. And it says, The heaven shall reveal his iniquity, and the earth shall rise up against him. And now let's go to this passage here in Leviticus. Leviticus 18. We've got three verses. Let's go to Leviticus 18. This is talking about what, what's going to happen if we choose to indulge in lust, licentiousness, and all the other perversities that, that followed. Uh, Leviticus 18. And we're going to see that this has an effect on the earth as well. Let's get there. Okay, Leviticus 18, beginning at verse 25. We're going to look at verses 25, 27, and 28. And 25 reads, And the land is defiled because of that licentiousness that they chose to indulge in. Therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it. So I'm visiting your own iniquity upon the land. And the land itself will vomiteth out her inhabitants. Verse 27, For all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled, that the land spew not you out also when you defile it, as I spewed out the nations that were before you. And so then he talks about, Christ goes on about how, what is your protection, your safeguard against being vomited out from the land? It's to walk in my statutes and my judgments, to return to the new covenant, to return to my ways, the promises that I've made to you. And here's a quote from Review and Herald, December 5th, 1907. And this says, How striking is the contrast between the prompt obedience of things of nature and the slothful disobedience of men, those for whom Christ has died. The Lord calls upon the dew and the rain and the varied agencies of nature, and they obey his call, to be used either in blessings or in judgments. And we know the scripture there in Psalms talking about his judgments. He's visiting our ways upon us. And in inanimate nature is represented as being shocked at man's disregard for God's word. So God calls for famine and plague and pestilence, for calamities by sea and by land, to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. So God is taking responsibility here. God is not directly exercising an arbitrary punishment. He's saying, my, and there's many definitions, and, and we won't go into that in this, about how the Bible defines and understands God's wrath and God's vengeance. And it's right in alignment with how we read in Psalms about God's judgment. And so continuing on here, we're going to look at, let's check out Deuteronomy 11. Uh, and we're going to go to, well, actually here, let's, yeah, let's get into this first. We're going to go into some slides now. In the deserts of the world. So the deserts that they just come about, you know, haphazardly and they're arbitrary. Or was, is there a reason for their origin? We know, we know 
starting at the first point of what we do know from inspired writings is that when the flood came, where did the where did the where did that curse, that, that threefold curse, the third and final curse, where did it fall heaviest in the world? Where the wickedness of men was the greatest, which also seemed to have to correspond to where the greatest blessings of natural resources, you know, of the precious metals and things came to be. They, they made those as gods themselves. They worshipped the blessings that were given, the creation rather than the creator. And so let's go to Deuteronomy 11, and let's, we'll begin at verse 7 instead. So Deuteronomy 11, verse 7, it's going to help us understand a little bit more about the deserts. Okay. And actually, um, maybe before I do, I want to read that first. Yeah, I think I want to read this first, uh, and then we'll go, then we'll go to Deuteronomy. So you can kind of hold your thumb there again, we're going to go to Deuteronomy 11. This is a quote from Spirit of Prophecy, Signs of the Times, March 31st. And this is, this is a description that uh, Jesus is accounting through Sister White of what the land of Canaan looked like when Moses and the people were on its borders, right, for the second time. And so Jesus reveals this to him. And this is what, I'm just going to read the bolded part of this quote. Again, Signs of the Times, March 31st, 1881. Angels of God presented to Moses, and I'll probably read more than the bolded part, it's pretty good. Angels of God presented to Moses a panoramic view of the land of promise. Every part of the country was spread out before him, not faint and uncertain in the dim distance, but standing out clear, distinct, and beautiful to his delighted vision. So every part was spread out before him that he could see everything. He seemed to be looking upon a second Eden. There were mountains clothed with cedars of Lebanon, hills gray with olives and fragrant with the odor of the vintage, Wide green plains, bright with flowers and rich in fruitfulness, the palm trees of the tropics, side by side with the waving fields of wheat and barley, sunny valleys, musical with the ripple of brooks and the song of birds, goodly cities and fair gardens, lakes rich in the abundance of the sea. And he goes on and on and on. So now let's go to Deuteronomy uh, 11, beginning at, we'll begin at verse 7. Still got to get there. Okay. Beginning at verse 7, it says, But your eyes have seen all the great acts of the Lord which he did. So here's the, here's the scriptural description right now of the land of Canaan. So this is what they were about to enter into. Therefore shall you keep all the commandments which I, which I command you this day. So understood in the new covenant, understanding that's a promise to us. That's a promise to the people. That you may be strong and go in and possess the land whither you go to possess it, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give unto them their seed, the land that floweth with milk and honey. For this land where you're going, that you will possess, is not as the land of Egypt from whence you came, where thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot. And if you look at the Hebrew root on that, it's talking about irrigation, using irrigation uh, as a garden of herbs. But this land where you go to possess is a land of hills and valleys that drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. And it shall come to pass that if you shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord, with, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all of your heart and with all of your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in its due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn, thy wine, and thy oil. And I'll send the grass in the fields for the cattle, that they mayest be eat, eat and be full. And so here's, here's what's interesting. Do you guys know that, um, have you heard of the region of Israel today, the Negev? That's a desert. And when I was doing some research recently, that's, that's now 60% of all of Israel is desert. And so we just read from the scriptures and from spirit of prophecy that that's not what the land was like at all. And this is, an after, this is after the flood, mind you. So this land went from, was almost a second Eden, as we just learned, to now is 60% desert. So the land is reflecting us. As we move away from the source of life, everything that we do, because we're now acting again by our own wisdom, which sets our own beliefs, it's going to result in actions that we take upon our brother and upon our sister and upon the land 
that will ultimately destroy ourselves. Because as we know, there's, what is there, there's a path that seems right onto a man, but the end of the ways thereof are destruction. And so this is, this is what we do, left up to ourselves. And so to illustrate that, it's telling us right here in verse 17, this is what happens if we don't hearken unto the Lord's ways. It says, The Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, lest you perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Okay, so let's now start to apply this into us today, the world we see around us, the natural world, and agriculture as well. Uh, as, as we already expressed, things haven't gotten any easier for us. Things have only gotten more difficult. The weather has become more erratic. Uh, desertification, deserts are expanding pretty, everywhere all over the world. What's interesting about deserts, too, the archaeological evidence is clear. Any desert region of the world they found evidence of civilizations, of great civilizations. They found evidence that there were once trees in those places that are now deserts. And so we're going to start to look a little bit more about its applications to agriculture and to us today and, and what uh, learning more through the scriptures and what spirit prophecy has for us as well. And so uh, God has not left us without hope. Despite the fact that this world continues to degenerate as man degenerates, reflecting us, God is still ever merciful. And so if we turn away from our ways which lead to death and turn onto the source of life, if we have the faith of Jesus, that will be reflected. And if we walk in the statutes and judgments, as we just read here, there will be rain in this due season. There won't be famines. You know, the crops will be sure they will be free of disease, and, and we'll look at this right now. Okay. Here's a quote from Christ's Object Lessons uh, that's starting to illustrate this very point about the fact that God has not left us without, without uh, restoration, the ability to restore. And, and it says here, Christ's Object Lessons 289, but if God's people followed his instruction, their land would be restored to fertility and beauty. And this is referring to the instructions he gave to Israel. God himself gave them directions in regard to the culture of the soil, and they were to cooperate with him in its restoration. Thus, the whole land under God's control would become an object lesson of spiritual truth. As in obedience to his natural laws, the earth should produce its treasures. So in obedience to his moral laws, the hearts of the people were to reflect the attributes of his character. So again, we're seeing this connection. God has, God has given us, his creation has given us nature for our benefit to see. Are we, are we hearkening after his ways? Uh, is our character being changed? Uh, or are we hearkening unto our own or saying our own wisdom? And is that being expressed out in creation? Is it a blessing or is it a, a curse? And even in the curses where God is allowing us to experience the consequences of our decision, it's still a blessing for us because it's telling us it's a litmus test to say, you know, turn away, danger, you're going down the wrong road here. Come back to my ways. And so here's, here was the original intention here of, as I, I alluded to earlier, of Eden, the Garden of Eden. And, and this says here, this is uh, Manuscript 121, 1899. If the people chose to manage the land... In their own supposed wisdom, they would find that the Lord would not work a miracle to counteract the evils that he was trying to save them from. The tithing system was instituted by the Lord as the very best arrangement to help the people in carrying out the principles of the law. If this law were obeyed, the people would be entrusted with the entire vineyard, the whole earth. So what's interesting is that the principles of the tithing system were the very best arrangement to help us for for the land to begin to restore and for us to be able to, um, to, to experience some of that intimacy that Adam had with creation and that the land, the land would respond to that and it would yield good harvest, good fruit, free of disease. And so uh, continuing on here in the same letter, the children of Israel were given laws and regulations which would give all nations on the earth a true idea of God's kingdom and government. Those who felt their entire dependence on God looking to him for instruction relying upon him for power to carry out his plans in the vineyard they were to, that they were to cultivate. They would receive the largest blessings and revenues. This is also telling us God was 
interested in our temporal well-being, and he is. He is interested in our temporal well-being, and it's reflected, again, in us submitting so that the faith of Jesus can work in us, so that we can walk in all the statutes and the judgments. It says here, uh, same, yeah, same letter here, next paragraph. Adam and Eve lost Eden because of their sin, and because of that, this, their sin, the land was cursed. Yet if God's people obeyed his requirements and followed his directions in regard to the tilling of the soil, the land will be brought back to a prosperous and beautiful condition. Men were to cooperate with God in restoring the diseased land to health, that it might be a praise and a glory to his name. And the land that they possess would, if managed with skill and earnestness, produce its treasures, so their hearts, if controlled by God, would reflect his character. So again, it's for, that's why we've all heard, you know, agriculture is the ABCs of education, and that there are so many lessons in it. It's because it's intimately linked and it's connected to our character development, our understanding of the true character of our Father and His Son. In the laws which God gave for the cultivation of the soil, He was giving the people opportunity to overcome their selfishness and become heavenly minded. So that's why the principle of the tithing system, because that's selflessness. It's returning what isn't ours, that we're merely given this to steward. And so as we reflect that law of liberty, the law of selfless love, through this tithing system, this will affect the land. As we saw that again in Job and how that was illustrated, when Job, if he would act selfishly, he knew thorns and thistles would increase. And so it says, those who cultivated the soil were to realize that they were doing God's service. They were truly in their lot in place as were the men appointed to minister in the priesthood and, and the work connected with the tabernacle. God told the people that the Levites were a gift to them and no matter what their trade, they were to help to support them, especially were those tilling the soil to bring in the rich treasures of the earth for the sustenance of the Levites. And I'll uh, finish that section with uh, Malachi. Let's go to Malachi chapter 3, verses 7 to 9. We're going to see again the principles of tithe, the tithing system in action and how it reflects uh, in the earth, how the earth responds. Malachi 3, 7, 11, 7 to 11. Okay. And that says, Even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, and there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that, you shall, that there shall be not enough room to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall, you, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the fields, saith the Lord of hosts. So, is it possible today, I mean, our whole entire agricultural system by which we're depending upon primarily uh, men who aren't submitted and aren't walking in the ways of the one true God, who are, who are acting selfishly, growing food in manners only to receive a profit at the expense of our health, at the expense of the land, and they're certainly not giving of this a tithe to those who are preaching the everlasting gospel, is there a consequence to that? Could that be affecting the land? Could that be why we have so much disease that's rampant in our fruit and it's so difficult to grow food? I think that that probably has a lot to do with it. And so now we're going um, to jump to some more pictures here. Let's, um, let me ask you guys a question. This will be more interactive. Hopefully the, the pictures will keep us awake. We're almost, I think we're almost done. So, so what was the Garden of Eden like? And before we go to the scriptures, what's that? What do we see there? Yep, so we're looking, that's an aerial view I took when I was flying over South Africa at Tabernacles. You fly anywhere in the world, you know, where there's modern agriculture, and, and that's what you see. Central pivot irrigation, that's why it's round, or, you know, square fields. And so, so, Let's see about, let me ask you another question. So, or let me ask the same question again. How about this? Is, would you say that, that that represents the Garden of Eden? Obviously, no. 
What are we looking at there? Erosion. Erosion. We're looking at bare soil. So we see, we see no protection. Again, so that's representing, without the righteousness of Christ, without the faith of Jesus, we're left completely unprotected to the ways of the destroyer. And so you see that violence and that force being applied to the land here, and you see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. How about that? Would you say that's more representative of the Garden of Eden? Absolutely. That's a real place, by the way. They know it. Yeah, that's, there's this um, garden just about 30 minutes away from us. Uh, it's like 230-some acres, perennial gardens. I'm sure the guy spared no expense. Uh, he's a, quite a famous landscaper, apparently, in the Atlanta area. And he's uh, created this garden, and, and I must say, like, it's, it's stunning. And, uh, and let me look, show you guys another picture. So same thing. That, that, to me, and I think to all of us, it, it brings forth more, yes, exactly, tranquility and peace, and much more of what Eden was probably like. And, and so now let's, let's look at what the Scripture tells us. Let's go to Genesis, a couple passages in Genesis, and we're going to get more of an idea of what that garden was like and what the atmosphere was like. To 31, and God said, let us make man in our image. So again, that image of father and son, husband and wife, right? With the ability to, as we were reading, to, to infinitely grow in our understanding of the God who is love. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. I don't think it means dominion like man likes to think today this dominance over and, and having creation submit to us and conquering and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth so God created man in his own image and the image of God created he him male and female and God blessed them and God said on them be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it well if we look at subdue the Hebrew word it doesn't mean like naturally our minds think, which would be again to conquer or to dominate, to destroy. And over the fowl of the air and over every living thing. And God said, this is a really, these next couple of verses are really intriguing. He's giving us a description of the, of the plants in the garden. I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. So let, let me ask a question. So is that, is that telling us that every tree and every plant, if I'm understanding correctly, that God created in all the earth was good to eat? It sure sounds like it right there. Sure sounds like it. And continuing on the last couple of verses of this passage, and to every beast of the earth, every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth on the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. So that, that's telling me, well, obviously there were no noxious plants, there's nothing poisonous, but in addition to being absolutely beautiful, like, like these pictures here, these are aesthetically pleasing, but very little of that is like directly edible. And so then let's go to one more passage, chapter 2. Verses 8 to 10 and 16. And it tells us, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to sight. So again, we know he's a God of beauty. And so when it comes to our gardens and when it comes to thinking about agriculture, I don't know about you, but let's see. This and this are not pleasant to the sight. And then, but he doesn't stop there, as we already read, but that it's good for food. And the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And do I want to keep going? There's 10 and 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, except for we know the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So just giving us a little bit of what the scriptures tell us about what that environment around us was. It was beautiful, and all these plants were edible, not only to us, but to all of the animals. And let's see, what else do I want to bring out here? So now I just want to look at some fun, just to finish this up, just some, some examples. Uh, again, God has not left us wanting and lacking. He has not left us with the inability to grow food to provide for our health. Because if we can't, if this body can't reach the level of health required to understand the deep things of his word, then... That doesn't, that's not the character of our God, the God that we serve. 
So he has provided us a way. And just as we will find him, we shall search with him with all of our hearts, that same thing needs to apply to every area of our lives. And so when it comes to, to understanding growing food into agriculture, if we've seen that our ways are leading on to death and we've seen the results and looking at some of these pictures, we've all experienced it, then there's another way to do it. And so I just want to look at some examples of, of different ways of, they go by many different, different ma names, but ways that are more representative, I believe, of what Eden would have been like and what a, a system that restores and, and gives more life is as opposed to one that destroys and takes away. Okay, so we looked at that. So here's what happens. This is the slide, the background there. That's what happens when we remove all the covering from the soil, when we're continuously applying. Everybody knows this, heard about the Dust Bowl. And especially when you do this in areas where are, they're more arid and they have less rainfall, you have even more problems. But if you have, well, I guess arguably you have different problems because where you have more rainfall and you have slopes and you take all the vegetation away, everything just leaves much faster. So soil loss through erosion, nutrients are leached from the system. Soil temperatures are elevated because there's no insulation, right? There's no covering. Uh, destruction of the life in the soil. The soil, the key, one of the key, uh, the key is to really optimal soil health and then optimal plant health and then our health is that that soil is alive. It's not dirt, as I think um, John Yu had said at one point in some presentation. There's a difference between soil and dirt. Soil is alive. Dirt is just the mineral components, the dead, sterile stuff. And so, uh, decrease of crop yields because you have destruction of that soil life, because the soil temps are elevated, nutrients are leached from your system, loss of habitat for all of the animals, right? That, so, as evidence, we don't eat animals, praise God, because if we think about the whole idea of eating animals that only came about because of our destructive thinking, which destroyed the earth, flood comes, all the vegetation destroyed. We know Ellen White says, look, animals were allowed to be eaten then, but that wasn't the diet that God intended. That wasn't the best way. So they choose to eat animals. So then they chose to, to just further, I guess, solidify in their minds the, to do what, that, what we did to Christ in the garden, which is we removed ourselves from the source of life. We crucified the Savior for us. And so death came. And so there's death in the animals. Our eating animals is just reflecting that. And so just continuing on, so the idea of animals and beneficial insects, there are far more beneficial insects than there are pest insects. Like I've heard figures like 100, I've even heard 1,000 to 1. So for every pest insect, there's 1,000 that are either neutral or beneficial. Uh, so you have dead zones that are in the oceans because all the nutrients run off into like the Mississippi River and then all flows in the Gulf of Mexico for, so for periods of time of the year, for a certain radius out from that estuary, that mouth of the river, there's no life completely dead. And so carbon, rather than being stored in the soil, goes up in the atmosphere and you, we all hear about, you know, carbon and we need a carbon farm and we need to do, you know, let's buy carbon credits. I'm, gonna, I'm a big destructive company that destroys everything, but I will cover that up by buying carbon credits. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's nonsense. Uh, reduction, and then also when, when you remove vegetation, vegetation perspirates, right? It gives off moisture and also holds moisture in. So you, you actually see a loss of rainfall as well. And so then you see desertification in areas, yeah, in areas where they are dry already, because we've removed all the trees, which is all the evidence of all these deserts and all the archaeological records, there were trees. There were trees, like I was reading about Lima area, and there were trees there. And so the ancient people, you know, they got too greedy. They wanted too much of whatever crops they wanted, and they just thought the trees were in the way, so they cut them all down. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Deforestation has devastating effects on the land, and especially where you already have less moisture, then, then the mineral concentrations in some of these areas, they become even more concentrated, and you have salinity issues. In California, they have issues with that. Australia, China, many places. And when you do, when you do these flood irrigation systems in very dry areas of the world, it's very dangerous because the evaporation rates and so these flood irrigation, the water already has higher salt content, evaporating quickly, your salt concentration then just goes up and up and up. And so then you all of a sudden, you have a very toxic environment and you limit the amount, the, the variety of plants that you can grow. Okay. So here's just one example of uh, well, why are we so far removed uh, from nature. 
And it says here, letter 131, his works as seen in the natural world are not one half comprehended or appreciated. These silent preachers will teach human beings their lessons if they will only be attentive hearers. Let me ask you a question. Why are they not one half comprehended or appreciated? Greed. But can we possibly understand the creation and appreciate the creation like we should if we don't understand and appreciate our creator? Can't happen. Just like we can't possibly love God with all our heart, all our soul, and our minds if we have problems with our neighbor, if we have problems with our brother. Our love to man is an extension of our love to God. And so I just have this definition. This is my definition of kind of what Eden would have provided. And, uh, and, and that in a lot of respects, guys, these couple of just these pictures I'm showing here, uh, this stuff isn't necessarily, it's not new. In a lot of areas of the world, they do this. It's just looked at as primitive and archaic and, oh, we've advanced past that and any number of things. But, but here's, here's what I believe, uh, obviously, we knew happened. And, and even those who had this, were in this country before us, the Native Americans, to a large extent, were doing this. And people do this still today in the jungles and in all kinds of places in the world in the tropics. So basically, the idea is a food forest is the smallest space required to produce all of our food, fuel, fiber, for clothing and medicine in a manner that is continuously improving the soil, plant, animal, and human life. So there's no, there's no taking there's, from something at its, at its expense in order for me to, to or, or taking at the at expense in order to give to something else. It's only ever increasing life. And so here's different names. People have, there's many different names for this today. Restoration agriculture, agroforestry, which includes silvopasture, alley cropping. And, and the, one of the key ingredients to all these systems, it involves perennials, it involves trees. And so that's, that's really the key. And you'll see pictures, and then that's, that's where we'll be wrapping up. So another name for it, forest farming. So that's, well, I'll, I'll talk about it. I'll show it in the video picture. Forest garden slash food forest, what I'm talking about, that's in planting a forest intentionally. That would be kind of like what we talk about in the garden, where all your crops are serving a function, whether they be of benefit for food, for fuel, for fiber, to the animals around it, to the soil, the health of the soil, all that good stuff, providing nutrients into the system. Another term, permaculture, another term, agroecology, syntropic agriculture, Gary Knight and Carolyn and Neil and others heard about. Um, well, she didn't mention it much, but there was a 17-year-old young woman at the Adventist Agricultural Conference back in February, January. And uh, she's from Brazil, her father and mother I don't know if they're first generation of Venice or what, but they took the council seriously where it said, you know, a family who has a small piece of land will live like kings and queens. And so they moved out to the country in Brazil, in the tropics there, and they came across a man who was doing systems like this, perennial based systems, where he's growing trees along with his garden crops. And it looked very much like these first pictures, which I, I'll zip back to. So you can imagine, oh, I just jumped over it. You imagine this, but where all of that, in addition to being beautiful, is also edible, is also medicinal. That's what we're talking about here. And so, so they were doing that in Brazil, and uh, she sh was sharing of the fact that they were inviting people to their farm, and one year they had over 400 people come, and they were able to witness that, look, all this is only possible, and the reason why we do this is because we serve a creator who is love. And some researchers came, and there were young, like some young men and a young woman from Germany to study their farm. And by the end of their time, I don't know how long they were there, the young woman was so intrigued by how they lived their lives. And she saw that they were worshiping, and she saw that they were praising God, and that she asked them if she could study with them. She asked them if she had never really looked at the Bible. And so by the end of this time, she accepted Christ. So we can look at farms, and that's a whole other presentation, but we can really look at farms as far more of an evangelistic tool than I think we thought is possible. So here's some pictures, and this is where we're going to finish. Here's an example of perennial systems. What do we see there for people who have been in the tropics? Bananas. Bananas and papayas, and there's probably that stuff underneath. It could be sweet potatoes. It's probably something. So there's the idea of you're not just having a monoculture, right? There's at least three species that I can see. There's probably many, many more. It, doesn't that look beautiful? It looks a lot better, kind of easier on the eyes. Here's another system. This is more agroforestry, the idea of having forest crops and then also having crops in the understory. And so if you prune things, you have more light. If you don't prune things, you have more shade. And so then 
depending on how you're ranging, how wide, determines what crops you can grow and put in. But again, it's you're not just seeing a vast expanse of one thing, which has so little diversity, which has results in so little resiliency if you have disease or epidemic, and it, it doesn't look nice, and it doesn't allow for the maximum amount of beneficial insects and microorganisms and all that good stuff. Here's another one. This is cool. This is probably, if I had to get the trees, those might be some type of aspen, um, and that's wheat. So that's called agroforestry, and that's alley cropping. So they space that out wide enough so that you could get uh, a, pe a combine, a smaller combine in there to harvest it. And so there's, again, a system of annuals and perennials. And there's a lot of wisdom in this system, and I won't go into the details of it now, but they don't need a day, they don't need 12 hours of sun in order to, to receive maximum photosynthesis. There are different groups of plants, like they call them C4 and C this and that. It's just about how much sunlight, how efficient they are, they're converting sunlight into, uh, you know. Row row yep, absolutely. Here's another one. This is probably would be more of a shade tolerant crop. I don't know what that crop is. It's not, that's not in the United States, as you can see just by the garb there. Uh, but this is another example. They're growing multiple crops, and they're growing underneath trees, and the trees are providing a gazillion benefits. And that's what they started finding. There's so much, I don't have time to go into that either, uh, but there's so much uh, work being done to re-green deserts right now, and there's some really, they're having some really phenomenal results. And primarily, you need water. As long as you can get water, whether it be from, a lot of these deserts, they have aquifers underneath, like the Sahara. But if you can get water in there somehow, and you can get trees going, it really starts to change the entire system. Life returns because there were trees there once. They were they were centers teeming with life. Here's another one of again a beautiful looking wheat crop. Those are not aspens. I don't know what those trees are. It could be pecans. It could be anything. But you could grow fruit food trees. You could grow um, trees for lumber, for timber, for fuel. Here's another one. These are probably eucalyptus trees, and again probably some sort of grain crop. Here's another beautiful one. That's a different system. That's more like market gardens. Like you're growing your vegetable beds. Maybe those are little sticks for trellises, or maybe that's something else. But you got, again, a mosaic. It's not just one vast expanse of corn or wheat or soybeans. It just looks, I mean, does that not look much more beautiful? Somewhere where you'd want to spend your time in the garden? Here's just an example of some of the crops that you can come out of these systems. So anybody, well, a few of you will know what, if you know what, well, okay. I'll just do this. Gary and Carolyn, don't tell them what the orange berries are. Maybe you don't even know. But does anybody else know what the orange berries are? China. China. That'll help you. No. They have the, like, fourth highest concentration of vitamin C on the planet. Sea berries. Sea buckthorn or sea berries. These are berries that nobody knows about, that, that they have been instrumental... Yes, we are. We planted a whole bunch of them. Um, and then I'll, I'll, our ne my next presentation, I'll show you guys what we're doing at Eden Point. Yep. And that's what they look like, yeah. So these, one of these little berries, which is the size of your pinky nail, has more vitamin C than an entire orange. 100 milligrams of this has like uh, between 600 to 1,000 milligrams or more of vitamin C. So what's the other small ones? Is that poke berries? Yeah, so the other small ones are currants. You got currants up there on the left. You got a shiitake mushroom. You got what look like... Those are some sort of cherry, the few there, so a couple of blueberries, uh, blackberries, and raspberries. So, yeah, sea berries were instrumental in restoration of the lowest plateau in China, which was completely desertified. I think those are probably um, jasta berries, which is a cross between currants and gooseberries. They get to, they're a shrub that can be anywhere from 6 feet tall to 30 feet, depending on if it's a seedling or if you prune it or not. Perennials. Perennials, yeah. Yep. Yeah, they grow anywhere from zone 2, which is like extreme, extreme cold, all the way to the Mediterranean climate. So they'll grow here, they'll grow here. yeah. Yep. And I'll, I think I have some pictures uh, in the next presentation about some of them. And, and I, I, anybody who's interested in this stuff, I mean, I can help you guys to find where to get these things and just all the details. Here's another example. This is beautiful. This is in Wisconsin, guys. This is um, a man in southwest Wisconsin. We call it the Driftless Area because they say the glaciers didn't cover it. It's, it's rolling hills slash small mountains. Uh, and, and this was a cornfield. This is a monoculture corn and probably soybeans. 
as you can see all around it, that's all it is. He turned that whole thing, which was a dead, barren, desolate wasteland, into this. That is row upon row along contours, so that you're, you're holding water and you're spreading water out of many, many, many different types of perennial crops, of trees, hazelnuts, chestnuts, black walnuts, butternuts, um, apples, cherries, pecans, et cetera, et cetera. And then in the lanes, he grows different annuals, squash, asparagus. All, it's, it's just it's incredible. I was at this farm. It's beautiful. So that's just giving you a closer up of what's going on in between some of those rows. And so in the spaces, they're growing whatever kind of crops they would want. He was marketing them wholesale. He grew it all organically. And so that is a large-scale example. That's over 100 acres. Here's an example of just a practical home level scale of kind of what it looks like as you're setting this thing up. You're looking at all those trees there and all those plants with the exception of probably, but maybe not, but with the exception of probably that grass layer. He's working on this where he started his planting his trees first. And then as he, as he did that, then he started working on the next layers and the next layers and he's doing it laying cardboard down. So the cardboard just suppresses that vegetation and then he can plant desirable species into that and so we can I think I'll talk a little bit more about some of the how-to but we've got all that on our YouTube channel Talking Rock and here's just another example of kind of hard the pictures aren't the greatest there but of multiple species together so like this one's a fruit tree of some sort and everything around it they pl intentionally planted that's probably herbs uh, pollinators you know medicinal edible and just different arrangements so it's like any beautiful place that we've gone to some garden like a, a, a ornamental garden, and it's just doing that except with beneficial food species in, a, as well. And so it's, it's absolutely doable. Here's an example of just kind of how these things are laid out, just different, different examples of trees and wh what they plant in lanes and how this, this mosaic is kind of created. And let's see, that's beautiful. I mean, that's how, that's how a lot of the landscapes used to be. And in, in, in some places in Europe, you can still see that difference. It kind of reminds me of like maybe like what Italy, you know, might look like, or maybe a French countryside. See, instead of one massive monoculture, they're having you know they're having strips of their corn and then different crops and then trees. And so that's just much more beautiful, much more reflective of God's character. I think. Here's another example of just kind of how these systems look. You know, these are again these are larger scale guys. These are multi multi acres. Just. Do it starting in a bed in your backyard, you know, or in your backyard. You don't have to be, this doesn't need to be big at all. You can, you can feed yourself and your community on an astounding amount, a small amount of land. And so that's the beautiful thing. So you're just seeing, like, this is, uh, like, what they call, what you would call a savanna, meaning these, tr these are trees that are just mulch around the tree. And those are at very wide spacing. So when they grow up, it's like trees amidst a prairie. And so they probably will graze animals in there. And then these are more where they've got tree and nut crops, maybe hazelnuts or whatever, and other berries right underneath them. And then they have, these could be for grazing of animals, or you could grow some other crops there. And a lot of this is planted, again, with the slope of the land so that you're minimizing, reducing, and building soil rather than losing it all uh, when you have excess rainfall. Because you want to, all the rain that hits our property uh, that God is giving us, we want to try to hold it. So that's why Neil was talking about cisterns. And, uh, and you can have living mulch or anything that you can do to increase your organic matter to hold that rain that falls on your land. That's a blessing. Because there will be times where, especially the extremes, as climate gets more and more extreme, there's going to be times we're not going to have rain. And so if we can store that rain in cisterns or we can store it in ponds, that's definitely going to be to our benefit. And use gravity to our advantage. And so then you don't even need any pumps. You don't even need any electricity. Here's another great example. This is pasture. Look at that. I mean, they're grazing their sheep in between tree rows. So that's an example of agroforestry, and they call that silvo pasture. Silvo just being um, the idea of trees, trees in the system. Uh, and so that's, that's much more beautiful uh, than having just, again, a vast expanse. And it's better for the animals. It's better for the trees as they went all the way around because then they have shade during the heat of the day. And they don't, have to, they don't have to work as hard. And so then, if, you know, your animals altogether will just, they'll be healthier. And, and when it comes to sheep and goats especially, but sheep as well, 
they're not just grazers, they're, they're browsers too. So they, you can provide them with fodder, which is just a name for like, to be able to browse on trees and tree branches. You can provide those to them if you don't want them to destroy your trees, or you can do it. There's many different ways. But of all the animals I'm interested in raising, which are very few, um, sheep is something of interest, obviously, for the wool. I would love, I would love to do that. Here's another example. This was just before this guy bought this in Iowa. That was just alfalfa field. Or I know before that was corn or soybeans. And then they, they put it all into a diverse species mix of things like alfalfas and clovers. And then on contour, along the contour, he planted these rows. Every one of those tubes is a tree in it. So he's going to have that system where he can graze livestock in between. There's another example from a different angle. Again, so that it's, it's just the more, the more diversity we can, we can put into that system, the more robust it becomes. The more, the more that it's reflecting, again, it, it's reflecting the beauty of God's character. It's reflecting just some of the, the depths of, of who he is. And I just want to finish with that picture. This is a beautiful reflection over another one of the ponds that gives gardens. So, so that's, um, that's a little bit of what I wanted to show you guys. Hopefully, uh, hopefully this is inspiring and encouraging. And uh, probably the, the next and last presentation I think I'll be doing is I'll show you guys what we've been doing thus far at uh, Talking Rock. And we really just started getting going here this year. We started to do a little bit last year. So we're very much in the beginning of this as well. And I'm learning and uh, and. I really, by the grace of God, like to have that approach of coming to this, coming to the lesson book of nature, just like we come to the Word, uh, knowing that we know nothing as we ought to know, and just asking, teach me, Father, and, uh, and then give me the ears to hear. So, uh, yeah, thanks, guys, for taking a look at this, and we'll end with a prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your statutes and your judgments, for your appointed times, Father, and for, uh, for the understanding that you have given us that this is a law of liberty, this is a law of love, and that they are pro these are promises to us, your promises, Father, the new covenant promises that it will be written into our hearts. And Father, our, the work that, that we have before us is to allow the faith of your Son to work in us. And I pray that as our characters are changed more into your image, Father, that, that it will be reflected on the land, Father, that is around us. For those that you have called, Father, to, uh, for all of us we know, anytime we can get out of nature is a good thing, Father. But I pray that you may help us to read your lesson book aright, Father, you may, that we may see more of your goodness, your mercy, and your love, that you may help us to grow Food as your word has promised us, Father, that it is free from disease, that may be a witness unto all those around us that may draw, draw them unto you and to your goodness. Through your Son we pray in his name. Amen.